I guess let's just start with Death Kings then. You mentioned to me that you were doing, you're tracking some vocals yesterday. So talk about that and talk about what it's been like working on the project. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, uh, for all my years that I've spent in music, which is at this point is about 15 years, um, this has to be one of the most enjoyable projects I've ever taken part in. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a, t it's a team of people that I just, that truly, you know, like both Stasic and Mikey Karuba from Turquoise, um, both really like believe in the spirit of rock and roll. And, um, it's really cool to link up with people that just unabashedly feel that way. And it's very, it, it's hard to describe, but, you know, obviously in the different bands that we all play in, um, you know, we kind of run the gamut in terms of genre and, and turquoise is specifically more kind of like the, the upbeat, like funk stuff. Um, but it's really cool to just go like, like really dive into the, you know, all of our respective roots with like rock and roll and punk and thrash and like all that stuff. Like, like we all, that's all like very much in our blood and in our DNA. And it's cool to be able to do it just so shamelessly, you know, like, and, and without any worry about what it's supposed to be and what, you know, what, like it's just pure joy and, and pure expression. And, um, it's, it's been, been amazing, but yeah, so we've been, you know, the, the project started off in, in a funny way, because, you know, really it, the genesis of it was my connection with, uh, you know, Stasic and Chris from Umphrey's doing Green Day sets, you know, like that's where it all started. And actually the ironic part about that is, and most people don't know this, but um, that band, like we called it Dookie because we played all the whole Green Day record and then we would start doing like Ween stuff and Weezer stuff, but it was mostly surrounded surrounding the Green Day record. It was actually supposed to be Mikey and um, Taylor from Turquoise. That was going to be the trio. And then there was a scheduling conflict. And then I'm talking about 2017 at summer camp. That's like when this was supposed to happen. And uh, there was scheduling conflict. And so they weren't able to do it. And then Stasic was like, yeah, I'll do it. But like, I want Chris, I, I want like Chris to do it too. And, and it was kind of interesting that Mikey, like there was already like those paths were kind of crossing by accident, like, but they weren't connected at all yet. And uh, really what happened was, is that, you know, I, that, that was my first time really getting a chance to connect with Stasic. Um, in you know, I mean, when you start playing music together, it's it's one thing when your bands tour together, we open for them or you know something like that, and we'd done that maybe a couple of times up until that point, but it was pretty limited in interactions. I'm um, always cordial, but just you know, um, it's different when all of a sudden you're in a practice space or you're on stage together, and so we kind of just started bonding early then, and and I mean, anyone that's met Stasic knows that he's pretty easy to get along with. I mean, how could you you know? I mean, the guy's just a fucking bundle of joy and and I love his outlook on life and so we, we connected pretty quickly and so I feel like after that experience him and I were just always looking for opportunities like wouldn't it be cool if we like wrote music like this and you know and and what would happen and you know it was it was hard to to really find the time for that back in you know 2017 2018 is when we started like I feel like 2018 early 2019 is when we started talking about doing original music more but at that point, both of our bands were touring a gazillion dates a year. And, and you know, when Stasic comes home, he's got a family. And, you know, obviously balance is important for everybody. And, and uh, it was just harder to find the opportunities to really work on it. But even as early as, like, I think maybe, I don't know the month, but sometime in 2019, we started sending, like, just, like, little ideas back and forth over Gmail with no real intention other than to just be like, isn't this cool? Or, like, maybe play something on this. And there was no real structure. And then... It sort of turned into like, you know, when quarantine hit, we're like, well, shit, all I have is time, you know? And yeah. like, and so that kind of became a focus for both of us. And, and it just started, you know, I don't know, we, it, it was interesting finding a way to work remotely because, you know, he's at, down in South Carolina, I'm up here in Buffalo. And, um, and so it started with just Stasic and I, you know. And then bringing Mikey in. So was that because you were going to work with him before or you know being both in the in the same area again small world i went to starpoint with mikey karuba so <laughs> keep the small yeah. world thing going there <laughs> yeah karuba collision you know I mean, definitely for any, any buffalo people watching i mean you've seen the sabers games you know definitely uh, 
<laughs> that's so that is so funny what is what a small strange little world we live in you know yeah and i and i love and then that's another cool part you know so mikey doesn't live in buffalo anymore but you know he's he's still so connected to the city and i feel like anyone that's from this area definitely has a certain sense of pride about it and so it's him and i have always shared that kind of buffalo brotherhood thing and um but no you know mikey and i you know he was he's always sort of been like an older brother to me and he was um an early advocate for you know because with aqueous you know none of us went to music school none of us like you know had any formal training and so i think for us there was when we first emerged onto the scene there was a bit of a feeling of like you know just that like we went you know we we thought like okay like these guys all went like all these bands went to berkeley and everybody's really like we could all play and i all had intuition but i feel like mikey and and, and turquoise like they were like they really um believed in our band and believed in me and and i feel like mike you know mikey would always like kind of connect me with the right people and 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 sort of just be a champion um you know and an advocate for our band and and so i've always had a great respect for him and looked up to his musicianship but over the years we've just formed a really deep friendship and um we've done a bunch of different little side projects together over the years and i remember the one we we had a long drive together and uh, we discovered on that drive that we both like love heavy music you know we were listening to like a lot of like queens of the stone age and like older metallica and like just like cky and like all this heavy shit and so when i learned that about him i was like you know and we, we always said like we should do something really heavy together and i remember like even pre-quarantine i i had you know stasic and i had made like one one or two like little demos just kind of like whatever and uh, i sent it to mikey and he's like dude like i need to be on this project like please let me like like i'm the guy and and so like a lot of time passed and then you know as when, when quarantine did happen i just started like you know both stasic and i started cranking out ideas and then you know i was like you know when we, him and i were talking like you know because we had rob you know it's in, it was so interesting actually the day that covid like really like really um you know, kind of took hold in terms of like things being canceled. We were actually in San Diego. Um, we were about to open for Umphreys for a couple of dates up the West Coast, Aqueous was. And Stasic and I had booked an after show that exact night in San Diego doing a project called The Hazards. And it was going to be our debut band with um, the drum, our drummer from Aqueous, Rob. And so it was going to, it was going to be this like, you know, we were just going to do like punk covers of like, Fugazi and and Bad Religion and Pennywise and, and you know and and we we had talked about maybe doing an original but that really wasn't developed at all at that time and it like all everything got canceled the morning of that so we were like this close to starting this new project and then it never really got off the ground and so when we went home we kind of went back to the drawing board and 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 you know I had rem I had remembered that I'd sent the track to Mikey and he so he was kind of gonna you know in terms of like the concept for the band it was you know he was gonna be the one for like studio stuff and so we we're like let's just start a whole new entity you know because and previously you know we had done these iterations with chris myers too where it was like mostly just the green day stuff and then punk covers and so we've kind of always been circling the realm of this type of music but when it came time to like really write original music like I, you know mikey he just had such a passion for it and i remember like 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 when i send him it like it's he's an awesome person to work with you know because like you know, i'll send him a demo and he'll write back i remember like they sent him something and he wrote back dude in all caps like 10 times and then called me until i answered you know and it's 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 his enthusiasm is really contagious and it's awesome to work with people who believe in you and believe in rock and roll and so like putting myself and stasic and 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 Mikey into one project is sort of like a dream situation for me in terms of like just even the spirit of the thing because if there's no pressure everybody's having the best time and like but no one's afraid to get really fucking heavy too so that that you know when, when it came time like Mikey was just clearly the guy and so we uh so that and we gave him a call and and, and that was that that's awesome and that's the exact way an artist wants to create something with just free will and no pressure and just to have fun that's when the best art is made i think i i completely agree i totally agree yeah so talk some more about then 2020 you know march 2020 you guys are on the west coast and so you're already there and now you have to get sent home and so what was that all like for you as a touring musician yeah that's that's a great question and uh i don't i you know i feel like on one end of the spectrum, 
and I don't want to be too crass here, but it was sort of like a blue balls situation where yeah. we were really excited to link up with the Umphreys guys. And, and I, I personally like love the West Coast. Um, I, I feel like I really resonate with the energy out there. And like, I've even thought about moving to San Diego. And, and so I had been really excited for that leg of the tour and we'd already been on tour for a couple of weeks. Um, but it was, it was strange because by the time that we got to the West Coast, I could already sense that things were changing. You know what I mean? Like I remember going out for a beer, like I got there a couple of days early. Like we had, we had played a festival in Arizona called the M3F festival. And that was actually the last act, the last show we played, you know, in terms of like 2020, like show, show before COVID really turned things, um, turned things around. But, uh, um, I remember going out for a beer and, uh, like they were washing the tables in between and the bartender was wearing a mask and I was like, what is happening? You know? And, 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 and I kind of just got like, it was just sort of a strangeness. And, you know, of course I was paying attention to the news and, and learning quickly the scope of things. And, um, you know, I remember getting, I, I stayed up like real late that night, like rehearsing for, you know, the side project we had the next day with, with Stasek and, and my drummer, Rob. And I remember like waking up the next morning and my manager was like, call me as soon as you can. And I called him and he's like, well, tonight, it looks like they're canceling tonight because of this COVID thing, but we should be good for like the next couple shows. And then he called me back 30 minutes later. He's like, whole tour's canceled. And I was like, what the heck? And so it was sort of a, you know, I mean, it was one of those things where, you know, I, I've, none of us have lived through a pandemic, of course. And so it was definitely a peculiar, almost eerie feeling like, what is like, what's happening? I mean, if it's on this large of a scale and so there's fear, you know, around that. And for me, I do, you know, I struggle with, um, like a little, you know, some health issues myself and some autoimmune things. So I, you know, I was kind of like a little freaked and, you know, I just wanted to get home as quick as I could kind of just in case. And so, yeah. um, you know, I, I rent, rented a car and uh, drove to LA and, and then flew flew home. And it was weird because I, I remember going, you know, coming back to Buffalo and people still hadn't quite gotten it yet here. You know, like where like I, I remember stopping over at Ironworks to pick up gear like that I had just stored there or something. And there was like a show happening. And I was like, I don't think this like I was like, I don't think this is going to be like lasting too much longer. And then, of course, like two days later, everything was shut down. But um you know, I, I mean, I, I'll say quarantine, I think, has meant a lot for a lot of people. I, I feel like it's important for before I discuss any positive aspects or silver linings to just kind of, you know, just say without any ambiguity that like, you know, this has been a moment of horrible suffering for a lot of the world. And so, you know, I mean, I always try to make the best of situations, but any, any positive aspects that I talk about are in full respect to what people have gone through up until this moment. Um, and including this moment, I mean, India is, is, is in a really bad shape right now. And I know many people who have lost family members, um, and, and it's just been obviously quite devastating and for a lot of people. Um, but for me personally, um, I think it's been, sort of a positive um, thing that's emerged from it has just been having the time to get a little bit more balance in my life and focus on my health and wellness and mental health um, in ways that I hadn't been able to, that I, you know, maybe that I've wanted to for some time, you know, but just given the rigorous tour schedule that most of us have being into in these jam bands, um, there really hasn't been a lot of room for that type of thing, at least, at least not, not room, but not room for follow through, because it turns out that type of work is actually like a full-time job until you get yourself you yeah. know, situated and get, you get a good system built. And for me, yeah. I'd been putting it off since I was like 15 years old. So, um, I'm 31 now, so it's a little overdue. Um, but yeah. I, I have to say that like through this experience, there's been a lot of serious ups and downs and, and, you know, questioning things and reworking things and reshifting things. But ultimately I, I, you know, I'm, I'm actually kind of experiencing a little renaissance, a, a personal renaissance where I feel like I'm actually happier and more balanced than I've ever been. Um, but it's been through like, you know, good diet and counseling and like, you know, a lot of us have things that we've gone through in life that we just don't process or, you know, and so for me, this time has really represented that. And it's been amazing to have, the time to kind of put some of that experience into music. Um, and I think that's where kind of the Death Kings project comes in is because, um, you know, I, not, the idea that myself and Stasek have time to just like 
be giddy and sending riffs over Gmail every other day for months is like not a luxury that we're that we're used to. And and so, you know, it's been sort of a mix of spending my time kind of just restructuring my life um, in a positive way and, and in, in, you know, implementing healthier habits and, and behaviors and things like that. And, and I've actually been doing a sober run since October. So, uh, you know, I, 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 and, you know, just kind of just that kind of, kind of stuff. And I've reconnected with my skateboarding roots and um, that like it, it all kind of culminated into like this type of project being able to happen because for me skateboarding and heavy music go hand in hand and like you know i feel like being in a good mental state like kind of getting in touch with uh, you know some nostalgia and some joy from my you know from earlier in my in my life um and then having the time and, and connection to work with someone like stasic and mikey um, on a project like this has actually been a beautiful silver lining because now we, we have a new band. Like that's that's a that's something that's a gift I was given through this time. That you know we might have been able to string something together, but not like the time and care and love that's now gone into what we're making is much more than this ever started off as. And that's been fun to just kind of appreciate that and take advantage of the time and uh, you know and just kind of go full full bore on it. You know. Yeah. I love that you've taken this time to, to do that because I think whatever your kind of beliefs are, I feel personally, cosmically that in some way this was supposed to happen um, to force us to look at things in our lives, things that we were doing that wasn't serving us, whether it wasn't healthy, physically, mentally, relationship wise, you know, any of these things that we were doing in our lives that were like, wait a minute, it's not what I want. It's not the best for me. And being stuck in your house, what else are you going to do but evaluate yourself? So <laughs> yeah, it's like you really didn't, you know, I feel like a lot of people had that moment where they had, they had no other choice but to look at it. Whatever there were the, no distractions. There wasn't the any was. music. There wasn't any sports. There wasn't any whatever. There weren't these distractions and people actually had to evaluate what they were doing. And I yes. think it's good that you, you use that time to do that because you're going to come out of this grown. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, I mean, I think it's also one of those things where, you know, most people on both sides of the uh, of the fence here in terms of music fans um and you know people that just like love to go to the shows and see the shows and and go on tour with the bands and stuff and then the bands themselves i feel like you know you have something taken away like that and you and you and you gain a whole new appreciation and perspective for what it's meant for you you know in your life and i know like even the small amounts that we've been able to perform um you know like you know doing these drive-in shows and that kind of thing has been like incredible you know like where it's it's almost like i feel like a kid again you know in regards to you know just the simplicity of of playing music with my friends and seeing people smile in the audience like you know that's it's it been such a, a huge part of my life for so long um that you know having it taken away in such an abrupt and lengthy way compared you know i mean i've spent you know, 17 years almost at this point, go, you know, touring and playing shows and being at festivals and just being really entrenched in the scene, being able to take a step back, um, definitely shed a new, a new light on, on how grateful I am to get to do that and to have that connection and, and not even just performing, but seeing shows and connecting with people and, you know, socializing in the way that we get to. And, you know, you really see what a community you do have there because, you know, that, context is where a lot of my friendships occur and where my community lives and so when that and i think we've all experienced that like the people you know from the touring or from the bands that you love that's where you see them and so when when this all happened and you know quarantine's going on you don't see these you know like even these my band friends and stuff like someone like stasic like normally i at least get to hang out with them a couple times a year just like on the road or at a festival or whatever and then all of a sudden like a year and a half goes by and you know i don't see any of these people and so it was interesting kind of like learning the value, you know, just kind of even seeing the value on a deeper level of all of those connections um, be between our fans and, and our peers in this, in the jam scene, you know, and uh, it's just, it's definitely been an interesting time, but I know like I'm more grateful than ever to play music, you know? 
Yeah. And as, from a fan perspective, I'm more grateful than ever to be able to go and finally see some music. I thought about it, and I think this was the longest time since my my first concert. I was eight, and I went to go see Michael Bolton. And oh, wow. Michael <laughs> yeah. Bolton. Yeah. My mom took me for my eighth birthday. So I think since I was eight, I've seen music I've, you know, every summer. Right. I'm 36 and I haven't seen any music in over a year. So that's really, really weird. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Not even I, somebody playing a guitar in a backyard somewhere. Like I've right. seen nothing. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, it, it was interesting. I actually just recently did a couple of solo acoustic shows out in Rochester and uh, it was incredible. But, you know, like I... <laughs> having spent my whole life doing this type of thing, like I, I went into that like a little bit nervous for sure. You know, like, it's like kind of like, you know, I mean, I, it's, it's, so the other thing I was going to mention is I've spent this whole quarantine teaching, um, which has been incredible. You know, I, I mean, I've taught off and on over the years, but again, with the hectic schedule, it was something that was fewer and further in between. And now I'm doing it almost full time. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I'm, I, I've, I've actually had more time than, than I normally do on tour to like play and work on my instrument and teach and stuff. But even with that in mind, I was still like nervous to like be on stage again, you know, like it kind of like even did a little reset on that, like, you know, and there was a the point where we were doing 155 shows a year for a couple of years straight. I mean, it's, I've done this a lot. And even after all that, having this time off, I definitely got like the little butterflies and like a little anxiety for the week prior. And, you know, once I got there, it was, it was beautiful, but it took me a second to settle in, you know, and to even see people, there was still a socially distanced event. You know, they, they capped it at a certain amount of tickets for both nights. And, um, but it was like, just even being in that scenario again, was kind of like a trip, you know, like it, my, my mind was like, is this okay? Like, and it, and it was, it was totally safe and it was great. But, you know, like this past year has been full of uncertainty and fear and change. And, and so it was like, kind of almost like felt like too normal or something but then it was then it was awesome once i settled into it and ended up being like a really beautiful experience but yeah it's a, it's been a peculiar year for for sure were, were those your first ever solo show performances um it was actually my second um and the first okay. one was out of necessity I, you know i occasionally would do a duo with aqueous's guitar player where we just do like acoustic stuff and, uh, you know, he had like a family emergency pop up a couple of years ago at, where he couldn't do the show. And so I kind of did it, but I, it wasn't my intention to do a solo show. So these were like my first proper solo shows where, you know, I had like a, like a looping situation set up and, and I sort of framed it as more of a storyteller's thing where I kind of broke down a lot of the meanings behind the AQ stuff and then like covered songs that were meaningful to me and then like talked about them. And, and it was very connective and very emotional, emotional. And I, I really liked the opportunity to, you know, break down the barriers a little bit. I, I feel like I'm a big advocate for, um, you know, obviously we all have our onstage personas and like we, we, we do that thing. We, but we are those entities. We are those people. And, and it's awesome. Like there's nothing like a good rock show, but, um, we're also people. And I think it's, there's power and vulnerability and an honesty. And I, I feel like I've been finding um, a lot of goodness and connection and sharing a bit more with people and breaking down those barriers and helping people to recognize that like, it doesn't matter what situation you're in, like we can all, we all still struggle and we all go through things. And I feel like I just am trying to kind of get that message out a bit more, um, and to like kind of break down the stigma of like mental health conversations. And, and so I feel like it was, it was really cool to like really do that in a more focused way. Um, and, uh, and, you know, for me, like doing the solo stuff, I mean, I've also spent this past year working on, uh, I take voice lessons every week too. Um, nice. you know, partially inspired by a, a, a traumatic experience I had where, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. I feel like one thing I was just going to mention that, I, you know, with Umphreys is, uh, I remember the first like couple shows we did opening for them, someone like tagged me in a thread that was in like one of the fan pages or something. And it was like a 270 comment thread of people like arguing about my voice. Someone being like, oh, this guy sucks. Like I hate his voice. It's like the worst voice ever. And then someone being like, no, I love his voice, you know? And, but it's interesting. Cause for me, I've always, you know, 
um, guitar has been like something I felt very confident about and, and like I can really express myself there and uh, it's come very naturally, but vocals um, were something I did have an insecurity about. And uh, I've, I've always want, I've taken voice lessons like here and there over the years, but I've been doing it in a more focused way with this guy named Keith Harker. We do it over uh, Zoom and um, it's cool because he's actually been teaching me to sing like uh, in like, and yell and like do all the because like this music that we're doing now is like really fucking heavy so like i'm trying to figure out the right character for that and uh now i'm like learning how to use my throat and, and my and my diaphragm and get like all these guttural sounds and stuff but but anyways it was a nice opportunity for me to do a, a, a couple of sets that were more fo like vocal focused you know and previously that's been a point of anxiety for me and now it's becoming something i i'm like settling into a lot more and it's very exciting to make that progress you know um so sure. it's 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 yeah it's been it's been good that's awesome i love that you are so open and such an advocate for discussing mental health anyway i am so big i could go off all day about that subject yeah. um but especially because you're a man and i I think it's so important for men to be okay with talking about their mental health. There's just such a stigma where, you know, don't talk about it. It's not manly. Don't be a pussy. Any of those other things that you, you hear on the playground and everything else. So I think it's great that you're using your platform to talk about that anyways, but to also, you know, talk about it as a man, because I think it's important to, as you said, be vulnerable and have that power in it and tell people it's okay to not be okay and to own it and to need help or therapy or whatever. So just anyways, I think that's fantastic, but thank you. you know, and being I, and a man, I think that shows a lot of strength. Yeah. And you know, I feel like it's less strength and maybe more courage. I like to make that distinction because, you know, um, I feel like I, a lot of the conversations I've had recently, I feel like I hear people talking about like this need to like be strong all the time. And it's more about like vulnerability and courage, I feel. And, uh, and you know, I, I think uh, I agree totally with what you said. And I feel like it's nice to see at least a slow shift occurring in regards to how masculinity is defined. And, um, you know, clearly, Clearly, men feel all kinds of emotions, but they get so repressed that a lot of times they manifest as anger or manifest as, you know, uh, you know, whatever, like any number of unhealthy expressions and, you know, suicide rates are higher in men and, and it's, you know, it's, it's not random, you know, it's because it's been, you know, up until very recently, it's not been exactly easy or acceptable to open up about those things. I feel like luckily in the, um, music world um you know that's been you know i think a lot of people that are creative go through a lot of mental health stuff and you know it's it there's it's been easier for me to connect with people and have these conversations openly um in our music scene in our industry and like there's stuff i see emerging like backline and like there's 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 I, I'm grateful that our little community has at least a little bit of that going on, but it, 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 there's so much more work to, to be done. And uh, I love to encourage it because, man, I feel like if anything, like good communication is, is so critical. And like you talk about relationship dynamics and you talk about like, I mean, any number of aspects about a, a man or a woman's mental health like are just so relevant and uh and you know in our own scene we've seen people struggle with with mental health to the point of suicide and 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 i you know it's it's a really hard thing and and it's it's i i appreciate your kind words uh and it's something i'm very committed to you know um and so i'm looking forward to figuring out ways to continue to you know integrate that into the conversation in our little scene here yeah, it's important. It's it's a heavy conversation, but it's one that I think everybody should have because even if you're not suffering from something, someone you love or someone you know is, even if you don't know it. So it's important to to keep the conversation open. So yeah, there was this old actress named uh, uh, I think what was her name Elaine Stritch. I think what it was. She she was uh, if anyone watches Thirty Rock, she played Jack's mom. But she uh, she had this quote. I watched this like some random documentary about her, and she had this quote that always stuck with me was that everybody has their sack of rocks, and it's like you know you no matter what, yeah. it doesn't matter like 
what spectrum of suffering or what you, I mean, there's, you know, all kinds of things that cause trauma in somebody's life, but everybody has got that load that you can't see and even, and whether they're even fully aware of it or not. And when I think about resources, like whether it's medicine or counseling or healthy eating, I feel like all those things are just like slowly taking rocks out of your bag, you know? And mm -hmm. so I feel like I've been, I'm trying to figure, you know, figure out ways to kind of encourage people to do that. You know, you don't have to like white knuckle your way through life, you know, as sure. you know, and, and I think a lot of us do, and, and a lot of us suffer in silence. And I, cause I think we, you know, people worry it'll be perceived as weakness, but it's, it's not a weakness. It's, you know, I mean, it's just the reality of being a goddamn human, you human. Know? being a human. And a human. we all have that sack of rocks, no matter what. So anything that we can do to lighten the load a little bit, yeah, just even helpful. sharing the community of understanding that, like, you know, like we, I think a lot of times people will look at even like what like Stasic and I do and like any, like, like what, you know, you would look at our Instagram and be like, wow, these guys' lives are fucking awesome and they're perfect and they're so easy and I wish I could do that. But they don't, you know, it's, it lacks all the nuance and subtlety of all of our respective difficulties or things we've struggled with or mental illness, any of these things, like it's never what it seems. And, and so it's, I think it's good to kind of, and, and that's kind of what I mean by breaking down some of these barriers is to just show that like, yeah, like everybody's going through something, you know, and, and that's all right. We can, or do we can do it together, you know? Yep. Community. That's one of the biggest things I've learned over the past year is how connected we really are, even though we're far apart. Really? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's funny because something like, like Death Kings, you know, I mean, Stasic and I, like, it was just something to stay connected to music and music, like music that made us excited, like when there really wasn't much else going on. And, you know, we would be on Gmail, like a bunch of times every week. And he'd like, just, you know, send me an idea and be really excited about it. And I'd send him something back. And like that, like, I feel like, this whole quarantine thing really also showed us how we can stay connected. Like, I feel like if anything, I've actually been in contact more with people like just over zoom and stuff like this than I would have previously. And so, you know, you gotta, you gotta count, count the blessings and, and notice the silver linings too. And there's, there's plenty of them, you know, for sure. For sure. Well, I would love for you to take me back a little bit since you said that you've only been playing guitar since you were a teenager. So what inspired you to pick up the guitar? Yeah, I mean, so my dad um, was a musician uh, himself. He was a, a piano player and, and he always had like some, you know, instruments just chilling around the house. And, you know, I grew up in that era where, you know, I was born in 89, right? So um, I was really primed to like be presented with all the shitty new metal. Like, like I loved Limp Bizkit and, and like corn and like, and some of that stuff, like, like actually corn's still pretty solid, but like, you know, like I, so I was really into that stuff at that age and it was all very guitar heavy, you know, mm -hmm. if, if not anything else, it was just like these ripping heavy guitars. And, and that was like me at like nine or 10, like just getting super into that silly <laughs> stuff, but like. Air guitar in it up in the living room. Yeah. Yeah. Like in front of a mirror, like pretending like, like, you know, and then, you know, I, I, so I have my older sister, um, she's three years older than me and she was always like kind of discovering stuff and then sh showing it to me. So like what it became pretty quickly was like, it started off as kind of like a lot of pop punk. So it was like Green Day and, uh, and I had, uh, and, and Blink-182, like those, like those bands, like it, that was just the era, you know what I mean? I was, mm -hmm. you know, 2000, I was 11 years old, you know, like that's the yep. prime time to listen to Blink-182. It was rebellious and it was funny and it was exciting. And they were saying the F word and, you know, like that was, For sure. that, that was rad as an 11 year old. I was like, they said fuck like 10 times. Like that's amazing. You know, <laughs> they'd show boobs in the video and you're like, yeah, <laughs> boobs, yeah, fuck yeah. You know? And so. So it started there and then I, you know, right around that same age, I discovered skateboarding and, and got like so obsessed with it. And, you know, to this day, I, I mean, I skate three times a week. Like that's, the, you know, been another part of quarantine that, re, you know, that's helped me reconnect with something I truly love. But, um, but a huge part of skate culture is the music associated with the different, you know, cause back then, um, part of the skate culture was around like releasing video parts, like where these guys, pro skaters would go out and film in the streets and, and, and build, build these like awesome skate parts. And then they would like sync up music with it, you know, and they would even time it out. Like where a lot of times, like the, when their trick would land, like it would be on like the downbeat of like whatever song they were playing. And a lot of it was like punk and like thrash and ska and, but then also hip hop. And so that was like, 
sort of the biggest thing that made me interested in wanting to pl like play it because a lot of that music it's not really about the technical side of things like it's not like a lot of these guys are crazy proficient guitar players or anything but they're putting a lot of raw energy into it and that really resonated with skateboarding and for me you know growing up you know around that age too like my family life got really crazy and so it was a beautiful escape for me like the skate culture the the culture of like punk and 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 underground hip hop and stuff and then you know with that came guitar and like i you know started meeting people that played and and so my dad had a guitar kind of chilling around our house and you know I, I would like play it when he went to work like i would just kind of noodle around on it but i remember figuring out uh brain stew by blink or by uh green day and i wasn't even playing it right i was just playing like one note instead of the like actual chord it uses but i it was like the most exciting thing in the world and so it was kind of perfect because a lot of the music i loved was simple enough to pick up by ear, you know, and then just slowly chip away at it. And so then skateboarding and guitar became my two obsessions and that's all I cared about. And then guitar like slowly eclipsed skateboarding like over time because it, it was tough too with skating like the way that you progress is typically you gotta they call it paying the tax but you fucking hurt yourself you know like you're gonna maybe like break break a bone or you know because you kind of just keep slowly upping the ante of danger you know like that's yeah. just yeah. The, that's just inherently how it is and so right you know i kept getting hurt back then and i would and, and that would make it so i couldn't play guitar and so i kind of just after a while i was like i'll still like follow skateboarding and, and engage with the culture but i'm gonna skate a little bit less and then eventually you know 10 years went by and i'm just on the road full time with aqueous but you know that's that's where it started for me was just noodling around on like you know and figuring out pennywise songs and bad religion songs and going to see like ska shows like my first ever like real shit well i i the I, the first like real real show i saw was uh brand new that fan brand new and they were at sh okay. uh showplace theater here in buffalo yeah it's just really shitty seedy little that little shithole yep yeah <laughs> and uh, actually aqueous played there later on like real early and, and you know but oh wow but my second concert was down at thursday at the square which like umphreys has played a bunch of times and we did one mm -hmm. with them once when it when they moved it to the harbor but it was uh uh mighty mighty boss tones and catch 22 and uh voodoo glow skulls and pie tasters so it was like a ska show and like that i learned about like moshing and skanking and that whole <laughs> that whole scene and i loved the energy of it because you know all these like music scenes sort of like like metal and punk and like they all have their own little like subculture and uh and i loved engaging with it and i always found like a deep connection to the people in that community and, and so i kind of ended up finding a home in the jam world later because you know i turned 16 and started smoking a lot of weed and all of a sudden i'm at a mo concert you know and then i saw I, and i remember seeing umphreys for the first time uh when i think i was about 17 uh, i went i drove to rochester with the aqueous's bass player and a couple of our buddies and we saw them at a uh, haro east ballroom and huh? uh and I remember, like, I don't know if I'll, well, they're going to find out now, but I remember during set break, it was like a smaller venue and I was like on Bayless's side and it was so fucking hot in there that mm -hmm. like, I like waited till their set break and no one was looking and I turned his little fan around and put it on my face, <laughs> which is like such a no-no. Like, I, 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 and it's funny because like, you know, we've toured with them enough now that we're like real close with their crew and stuff. And like, if Robbie like saw me do that back then, like he probably would have fucking punched me in the face, but like, you know, but that, nice but elbow. so yeah but like so but it's been interesting because like there's all these little communities and they're all a little bit different but they all share a certain thing in common and it's just that love of whatever the thing is like there's such unity in that and so it's uh it's sort of a full circle thing to kind of come back to my roots with people from my current life you know what i yeah, mean like yeah and, and there's a real joy in that because i see them connecting with a different side of themselves as well and it's also really awesome because when I, by the, when, you know, back when I was trying to play like punk music and stuff, I wasn't a very proficient player and the people I was playing with weren't either. And that was fine. Cause it's more about the energy and stuff, but fucking everybody in this band rips. So like, it's, it's really fun to like now have all this experience and ability and production ability and be able to like make something that we're really proud of. And, uh, and so I'm very excited for like what we're going to be able to do with this. Um, but that's kind of where it all started for me. Nice. So what made you decide that you wanted to do this as your profession? What for you was like, yeah, I'm all in. I'm going to deal with the ups and downs of being a musician and 
this is going to be my career. Honestly, I, I, I started the band Aqueous young enough that I didn't even realize there was ups and downs. You know what I mean? I, I, we started it in high school and it started off as like a thing in a basement for fun. And, you know, it just kind of grew and grew and grew over the years and, and it's, it's been wild, but, uh, I don't know. I, I think with guitar, it was such, a, an outlet for me of expression that it felt pretty clear early on that that was going to be what I wanted to do with my life. You know, like it's just there, it was a unique joy that I really couldn't find elsewhere. And I felt like it was the one place that I was really expressing myself fully and feeling like I was most connected to life and connected to my excitement and my passion. And so I feel like that it wasn't even really much of a conscious choice. It just was started one day eating up more and more of my time without me noticing, you know, and then all of a sudden, like, that's like all I ever did. And, and it, it's cool. Like, you know, it was, I, again, we started at such a young age that like, by the time we were hitting the touring circuit, we were like 22, you know, like we were pretty young. And, and uh, I remember like, even down here in Buffalo, like we've played like every, we played Nietzsche's 26 times, like before wow. we moved on. And, you know, then that turned into like, you know, we did like all the little shit venues around town. And then that turned into like Ironworks and that turned into ballroom and that turned into two nights at ballroom. And it's been like, you know, definitely a trip to kind of like see it grow. And then like, it got to the point where you're touring the whole U S and getting on these bigger things. And for us, like situations like this, like, you know, even me being in a band with Stasic or, you know, doing pro you know projects with like, you know, some of these bands, like we grew up listening to these bands. So it's, it's a, uh, it's definitely a, a thing that I don't take for granted at all. I mean, I definitely, you know, like I'm a fan, you know, like, yeah. I, and, and it's, it's funny to like, kind of have both, dynamics like you know i remember being the kid like raging the rail at the umphrey shows and like knowing every word and having that experience and then like it's also it's like almost like a different totally different relationship i have like with the friendship of the band and and especially with stasic and like you know it's been beautiful to like be able to connect like that because that when i was 17 if you would have told me that my head would have fallen off my shoulders you know um but it's it's cool you know and everything kind of happens in its time and um but yeah, I don't know. I, I think, I mean, it's funny because I did, uh, I did go to college. Like I, I was, I was actually going to be a guidance counselor, you know, I, I think, uh, and I graduate, you know, I graduated with a communications degree and, uh, I was going to go to graduate school to do counseling. And then by that point though, the band was already doing like, we, we were doing like the Thursday through Sunday thing. And even my last semester of school, they like, let me skip every Thursday, Friday class to be on the road as long as I handed my work in early. And so shout out to Buff State for being cool. That um, is cool. But, you know, I, so I kind of had like, you know, I feel like to be honest, I have to credit one of my ex-girlfriends for that. She was like, you should have a backup plan, like just in case and like whatever. And I was like, I don't give a fuck. Like, I just want to go on the road. And she's like, you know, like this would be smart. And I'm actually really glad I did that because I a lot of the knowledge and critical thinking skills I gained and writing skills I gained during school have actually been really beneficial to the band. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I was always going to do this, <laughs> you know, I feel like yeah. the second, the second I got a guitar in my hand, it was like kind of over, you know, like this, like that was it, you know? Yeah. I love that you have a same kind of similar story with, you know, being that 17 year old raging the rail and now your relationship with Stasic doing the podcast and, and doing the magazine that I do. I've had the same sort of thing happen with band members and i i think the same thing it's like if anybody would have ever told my sweaty 17 year old self on the rail that this is the yeah. life that i would have i'd be like you're lying there's well, no it's, way it's nice to learn that they're really like really good people too you know because that i think that goes a long way with a band that you love um when you sometimes you know you can be disappointed if you appear too far behind the curtain or it's not what you thought it was or whatever but it's mm -hmm. been nice to learn like with them that it's as awesome as it seems and they're, and they're really really great humans and so uh that's that's cool i'm glad you had that experience as well it's very yeah. special well and i'm sure for you as a musician um that has to be an inspiration that they're not the typical rock star guys you know you hear of the rock stars in the 70s living these you know fast lifestyles and you know of course it was a party back in the day for them but it wasn't to the magnitude of these stories that you hear so i'm sure that's inspirational for you as a musician to you still have that good character as a human but still be able to rage these rock shows 
Yeah, for sure. And I mean, at every turn, they were, you know, just a positive example of like how you could navigate this industry. And I, I've always had a great respect for their inner innovation. And I feel like even between Vince and Kevin, like their team, like they have everything just so dialed in and they've always surrounded themselves with people like Rob, Robbie is like one of my favorite people ever with, you know, that's their uh, stage manager for someone maybe that doesn't know, but um, like just top to bottom, they were always an inspiration, you know, just musically, like in the beginning, it was more just like, Oh, I listen to this band. I love this band. But the closer we got to their operation and like started doing shows and stuff, like they were, we were always learning things from them. And, and, uh, and then of course, on a personal level, you know, like connecting with each of them individually, some, you know, some more than others, but like over, over time, you know, we've had a lot of really cool opportunities to play with them or, or do the collaboration sets or, you know, have them sit in or, or what any, any of these situations. And every time I feel like I just like, I'm constantly learning. Um, and it's cool. Cause yeah, like, you know, they are, they're a generation before us, you know what I mean? They were doing shows when I was still in middle, middle school, you know what I mean? Like they're all like, you know, and, and I forget that sometimes, you know, cause I'm at that age now I'm 31. You said you're 36. Like I like, I'm at an age where like now that I'm this age, no one looks that old to me anymore. Yeah. But like, you know, there was a time like when I was 21 and they were like in their probably early mid thirties, like they looked like adults and I was a kid, you know, yeah. and now it's, it's different. Like, and I, and I kind of, you know, I, I'll forget sometimes like how that looked to me at, at one point, but, uh, but yeah, it's definitely been, been a, a pretty cool thing to, to be able to collaborate and, and make music. And for me, it's something that I, uh, it's like an honor, you know, like I, I, I take it seriously and, and respect it a lot. And, and, uh, you know, it's just something I'm grateful for all the time. For sure. So as a fan, what were some of your places to see Umphreys play? I mean, a lot of it was just around the Buffalo area, um, you know, and like surrounding festivals. Um, the, like I said, the first show I saw was at Haro East Ballroom. And then I don't think I missed a single town ballroom show after that for the next couple of years. Um, town ballroom shows are so good. I'm really going to miss those. Uh, yeah, I know. And I think, you know, because now having played that venue myself a few times, there is such an intimacy in that room, you know, cause you can still pack like 1100, 1200 people in there, which is a good chunk of people enough to have that crazy energy. But then, you know, every vantage point, like there's people that are on par with where you are on stage and, and it's, it's pretty small for like, you know, just the layout, like is quite intimate for its size. And so mm -hmm. I'm not surprised that they like played the caliber of shows they played there. So it was a lot of that. And then, um, you know, just, and I, you know, I would like travel to like Pittsburgh to see them and, and, you know, just kind of surrounding areas when I was like in my early twenties. And then it started to be like, we were on a lot of the festivals that they were playing. So I'd get to like, you know, we'd play our early daytime set in 2014 on some small stage on the side and then go watch Umphreys at night or whatever, you know? And so I, I remember like seeing them at Mowdown and seeing them at Peach. And then of course, like, you know, we've been, Aqueous has been doing summer camp since 2013. So like, I've seen like all the sets there and, you know, nice. I like, made it a priority to, to check those out when I could. And, um, and so, you know, I've, I've definitely seen them in, in a, pretty large handful of, of situations. Although I'm sure somebody in the Velociraptors for Jesus group would laugh at my show count, but you know, it, it, at one point it just, you know, we, we were, we were working on the circuit too. So, you know, my opportunities to like go see shows became limited because we were just touring so much. So it became more of like, just when we would cross paths or if we would open for them, because there's been a couple, you know, we did a, like a run with them in St. Louis and like we did shows with them in like uh, Richmond or not Richmond, uh, Raleigh and like a, a bunch, a bunch of just like one-offs and stuff with them in different parts of the country. But, you know, being well, everyone in the band is fans. So we'll always stick around and watch the shows and hang out and stuff. Yeah, for sure. Have you ever sat in with them freeze? No, no, no. All right. So if you could sit in with them, what have you ever thought about what song you would play? <sighs> That's a really really good question honestly this is maybe would be a weird answer but i love the groove of anchor drops um okay. like you know like i and maybe that's not I, I don't know like i feel like that's the first thing that came to mind i like the stuff that or maybe like professor warmbog or something like i would i wanted maybe just do something a little bit off kilter like you know i mean it'd be easy to be like miss tinkles or, or you know like any of these tunes but i'd want to find something that i could like contribute to in a way that wouldn't be like overwhelming because i think they already have so much going on. Their sound is so dense that I feel like a lot of times when you see sit-ins, it's more like horn players or like singers. And, you know, and occasionally you get, like I saw the Billy Strings one and like guitar players, but I feel like I'd want to find, I love like when they get in those groove pockets, like, cause I love the shreddy side, but like, I feel like I really resonate with like a lot of the rhythmic pockets and I'm a very rhythmic lead player. And so I feel like I'd want something that maybe has like a bit of a funkier, like backbeat, you know? 
um, that I could kind of kind of settle into. I always liked Utopian Fur as well. Um, and like a lot of the improvs in that song are, are pretty sick. So well, I don't, then I don't you know. could always rip some really nasty like punk cover in the middle of Utopian. Right? Yeah, exactly. Like, They're always throwing something weird in there. Yeah. You know? And so. side note, I have to remember the date, so I'll have to get back to you on this. But I don't know if you've ever heard the punk version of Uncle Wally. Don't they call it like Punkle Wally or something? I don't know if they actually called it that. Okay. But I was listening to something and just like you just talking about all this other stuff. I'm like, I have to tell him about this. Yeah, so I'm going to look up the date and send that to you. Because I love that tune. I mean, I listened to local band does okay like a thousand times. In fact, I remember the first time I played with Stasic uh, and Chris at summer camp. Like we had rehearsed like one or two times backstage at some of free shows that we were opening for. But I remember having this distinct memory of uh, I used to like when I when I was growing up, like I, you know, I, we didn't have, I didn't have, I came from like no money, but you know, we were really poor. And so I worked a job when I was younger, like cleaning hotel rooms and uh, it was a terrible job, but it was around the era that I was discovering Umphreys. And like the best part of the job was that I could listen to music. And I remember having this like really distinct memory of like cleaning a fucking awful bathtub, but listening to white man's moccasins and being like, wow, this is so fucking, like, I remember just stopping. Like I just sat there for like 10 minutes, like, and just didn't even clean. Like I was just like, listen, I was like, this is like, I just had to like it, listen to it. And I remember just thinking like, having this weird cathartic moment, like, like looking over, I, you know, I'm like sending them cues and stuff. And I was like, what, like, what the fuck happened? Like, how did I get here kind of thing? And it was just like an appreciation moment, but like, you know, I, I, it was just like a, a funny, a funny thing that I, that I, you know, like that just came, like, I hadn't even thought about it since that maybe happened. And I just had this moment come screaming back to me and it, it was cool. You know, that is really cool. I love shit like that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> What would you say is the greatest piece of advice you've gotten about being a musician? Or the most valuable piece? Something that you think would be the most valuable piece? Yeah, actually, I can give you an exact an exact answer. Um, so we had this opportunity once to do a, uh, you know, Brooklyn Comes Alive, that, that festival that they were doing in New York. Um, yeah. I, there was one year where I did three projects there. I did uh, the Green Day thing with uh, Stasek and and, uh, and Chris, and we did a Moquia set where it was us and uh, Alan Vin from Mo, and we did both Aqueous and Mo songs nice. interchangeably. And then um, what was the third thing? Maybe it was just those two things. I don't know. Either way, it was a busy year. But I remember Vinny like, pulled me aside and I don't even know if he'll remember because we were a part, everyone was partying and stuff, but like, yeah. he, I remember him saying something like, you know, we're not, I don't know if this was his exact quote, but something to the effect of like, yo, we're like not curing cancer here. Like you can relax a little bit, like remember to like have, have fun and remember that like what we're doing is like, it's not that serious, you know, like you can take your musicianship seriously and, but you know, never to take yourself too seriously and, and. And I really resonated with that. And I feel like uh, I kind of try to re remember that like at its core, music is, is truly a gift. Um, and it's a gift that we all share in together. And so I feel like for young musicians that are like coming up and trying to figure it out, I mean, there's a lot of pressure to always perform and a lot of pressure to be like, okay, like we got to do this, 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 and this. And, and like Aqueous, I feel like for us, for us, we always worked really hard. Like we always tried to be as tight as we could and for as prepared as we could. And I think at some point, like we, you know, maybe could have loosened our grip a little bit, like, and just been like, okay, wait a minute. Like this is let's just relax. And like, you know, and it's funny because quarantine has totally brought that to us now, like where it really was a great reset. Um, but that was an important piece of advice because we were like stressing ourselves out, you know, because, you know, the music industry side of things, you have like managers or, or promoters or like people that'll get in your ear about things and be like, oh, like, this has got to be a fire set. You got to, you got to crush this, got to crush this. But the nature of improvisation is actually in risk taking, meaning that there's no guarantee that it'll be great, you know, and that the risk that you take is, is that, you know, it's high risk, high reward. You know, if, mm -hmm. if, if you pull it off, it can be fucking incredible. We've all experienced those moments. I've experienced it playing. I've experienced it seeing shows. And then, you know, the same thing on the other side where a band will like, you know, they'll try something and it won't happen and then they'll move on and whatever world didn't end. But I feel like, especially for people in this scene, it's important to keep that in mind, like work on your chops, work on your musicianship, keep your show tight, but also remember to just have fun and remember it's, it's a gift to play with your bandmates. It's a gift to share music with an audience. And, you know, 
I think at every stage, the thing I learned is every band wishes they were at a, a stage the next band up is at. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, because and from like the dead on down, you know, like the dead is like stadium, fish is like stadium. Then you've got like Umphrey's Mo, STS9, you know, and, and so on down the line, the tears that people love to talk about. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't fucking matter. Like everything that you do, like, you know, I, 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 this is how I've been thinking about it is like, I've played some of the biggest shows in front of the most audiences. I played like some of my worst stuff ever and, and, and felt terrible. And then I've played like some of my best shows in front of like the smallest audiences, like, and, 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 and vice versa. You know, I've had shows where we played in front of no one and it was extra demoralizing when I had an off night. And then I've played in front of like, you know, thousands of people. And I was just like super on that day. And I walk away being like, yeah, you know, but there's no universal truth in it. And, 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 and if there is, it's just that like, just try to appreciate every moment for what it is and stay in that present and, and, and just, you know, I don't know, don't, like I could, I could, any show could be my last show, any, any day could be my last day. And so I feel like kind of keeping that in mind, which is interesting, kind of circling back with the Death Kings thing, because I want to talk about the name for a minute, if you're down, yeah. um, is like our look at, at death, you know, and like the, you know, the like kind of bringing that darker element into it is more in, in regards to like making sure you're living life, you know, and it's a celebration of death, like in, in the sense of it, well, rather a celebration of life in death, because mm -hmm. we've all lost people that are important to us. Like my, I lost my dad five years ago and it was such like a reset on how I saw life. And even his, like, you know, when he passed, we didn't do like, it wasn't like, I mean, it was sad. I mean, obviously it was very, very hard and I miss him all the time, but we celebrated his life. You know what I mean? And like, even like Dia de los Muertos down in, in Mexico, like I'm really resonate with that. And I think in Western culture, we tend to like grieve and, 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 um, focus on what we lost. Um, but I, I feel like a lot of our, our approach with death Kings, a lot of the ethos of it is to like celebrate life, you know, and like, you know, champion like that, like, yeah, we are all going to die. Like, let's fucking live life now. Like while we can, like fucking, if you're not get busy living or get busy dying, you know, like that's yeah. kind of, kind of the ethos. And so it's been, it's been neat to kind of have that be the thing, you know? I love that. And I love what you said about, uh, about death and how we really kind of, perceive it and how other cultures look at it differently as more of a celebration. And when I talked to Stasic about this project, he had mentioned that being something too. And, and I love that you guys kind of embrace that and was like, no, let's, it's actually a celebration. And the more you talk about the project and what you've gotten out of it and the whole story of everything, it's really kind of fitting. Like Thank it's, you. it's, it's really kind of spot on. Yeah. I appreciate that. And I, and I do believe like, you know, these people and these projects and like moments just come into your life at the right times. And I feel like it's, you know, it's not, none of this feels random at all to me. Like it all feels like it's something out of a storybook or something like it's just kind of playing out in real time. And, you know, <clears throat> it, it's cool to like see things kind of come full circle in these ways that we've talked about. And, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like both Mikey and Stasic are very real human beings and, and it's cool how we're even like our, our writing process is very inclusive inclusive like and we talk deeply about lyrics and themes and concepts and I even like wrote you know because I'm you know the band's like primary vocalist you know um and so you know when it comes down to writing lyrics like I I wrote the one song we have called Suicide Tuesday um that no it's not no one's heard it yet I'm fucking really stoked about it it's uh it, it was written after a conversation that the three of us had. And I like literally wrote down like sentences that they were speaking about the subject. And I, I, I don't want to give it away yet until it comes out, but um, it, it's a very collaborative thing, like where it's based in just like real honest conversations, like real life shit that we've all dealt with or felt or experienced, or at least talked about and touched on. And so there it's, it's funny because it started off maybe as more of a, and I don't want to call it a novelty, but like a fun, like one off, like, let's do some punk stuff, some silly, like, you know, because we were coming from like, drinking a shitload of tequila on stage and playing Green Day songs together. Like, that's what, was, what me and Stasic were having fun with. But then all of a sudden, like, we started like really tapping into some re like, deeper stuff in this project. And it the, ski the scope of it even musically changed. In fact, you know, I, I kind of at first it was gonna, it was more like the kind of punk thrash like thing. And like, even like the, the, the demo single we put out the f uh, fight is kind of more of that fast, like in your face thing. And some of like the spectrum of music and influence that's been brought in, especially because the three of us all come from different 
backgrounds, but have a lot of commonalities too. I feel like Stasic has been kind of bringing in almost like a nine inch nails meets like tool meets like Deftones kind of thing. And then Mikey's bringing in that kind of like de desert rock, like Queens of the Stone Age thing. And I'm bringing in like hardcore skater punk, but we all love all of that together. And so like the scope of music that's being created right now is like really exciting because it's you know it's in that vein but it's you know i'm not surprised because we're all from these bands that typically at least for umphreys and aqueous we can kind of play whatever we want you know what i mean as far as genre you know like and they have umphreys has songs that are like really poppy and then they have songs that kind of sound like the steely dan they have songs that sound metal as fuck like and same thing mm -hmm. with aqueous but maybe to less of a, an extent and so i'm not surprised that we started pushing boundaries quick but like already, like it started off as one thing and it's grown into something I could have never predicted. And, and I'm, I really believe in it. And a lot of people are really excited about it. It seems that the reception so far is excitement. So that's cool too, that people are, you know, because it's never about what everybody else is going to think about it, but it is nice when you're creating something and people are stoked about it too. Yeah, absolutely. And and of course, like, you know, I mean, we all want we all want to resonate like when we when you make art or when you make anything or do anything, of course, like it feels good when that resonates with people. I think it's been nice to like, create without any pressure in that regard. Like it's any any like if people love it, that'd be great. If they don't, we love it. You know what I mean? And, that, right. and so that's, that's enough for me. But I, I have a feeling like I, even the couple people I've showed some stuff to are like, super stoked. And, and I and I, it's cool. Like, you know, I mean, it definitely it's I'm sure it's not going to resonate with any everybody and like all our fans are jam fans. So, you know, when we're drawing from stuff that has very little to do with the jam world, I'm curious to see how it'll resonate. But a lot of people in the jam seem like heavy shit too. So um, we'll, we'll see what happens, but I, I feel, uh, either way, I, like I said, all three of us are all in on it. So I, uh, I feel like that alone is going to be a powerful entity of itself. Like just that kind of positive energy we're all bringing into it and that deep belief. And, uh, I think like when it comes time to like us actually booking shows and playing shows, which will happen, um, it's going to be intense as fuck. Like, you know, like, like we're, it's a lot of pent up energy. Like it's a lot, it, especially after this whole quarantine, and like the stuff is heavier than any music I've ever done. Um, and like, I literally bought a whole, like I, I invested in like a whole new rig just for this band. Like I have like a, a Marshall amp and like, I'm like tricking out my situation just so I can like really make sure to like bring a big sound, you know, when, when it comes time. And, and, you know, the, both of these guys just go so hard, you know, on their instruments and like their, their passion for it is massive. And so this, this record we're making, I'm very proud of already. And, and uh, I'm starting, it's like starting to finally come together and, and it started again from just two songs and then it grew into, um, which I guess we'll reveal is basically a full length record, <laughs> you know? That's sweet. That's very exciting. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Well, I'd love to know what is something that you would never leave for tour without? Beside your guitar, of course. That's a good question. Um, my Nintendo Switch. Nice. Easily. Because, uh, you know, I feel like like touring, it can be such like the time in between drives and stuff like that can be such a weird time warp. And it's very easy to like be on your phone or like, I feel like for me, like at least video like get video gaming i can like i don't know it's like a little ex escape for me but it also uses my brain because I, I tend to play like a lot of puzzle style games like zelda and like some like older mario games and stuff like that that take like at least some like skill to the yeah. cultivating and, and i i tend to like that so I, I i nintendo switch would be probably my main answer there that's like what keeps me sane and balanced on the road definitely and, much and honestly, better than scrolling your phone and reading awful news or social media or falling down that rabbit hole so yeah and it's really easy to do and you know i think especially when we're on tour and stuff too like it's you know i don't i don't need like sometimes it's not helpful for me to see a lot of the stuff like you know like fan i love that fans interact with each other like but those groups are for them you know what i mean like they're not really for us and sometimes like when i see some of that stuff online like it'll just bug me out or like put me in my head and and so i tend, tend to just like stay focused on my stuff and what I can do my best at and can control. And then otherwise just kind of roll with the breeze, you know? <laughs> for sure. For sure. No reason to uh, read everybody's opinion. Yeah. Like my dad used to say, everybody has opinions. They're like assholes. Yeah, ex right. Yeah. Exactly. Everyone's got one. <laughs> for sure. 
Well, um, that's everything I have, but is there anything that you have coming up in 2021 that maybe you wanted to touch on besides, of course, Death Kings and... Yeah, I mean, for for me right now, we're starting to put everything back together in the AQ camp and kind of get that machine churning again um, now that we know we can do it safely, um, you know, and uh, so that's been really exciting. Um, I also started a project with Haley Jane from ha Haley Jane and the Primates, um, and it's uh, pretty much the opposite of Death Kings. It's like the most quiet, mellow, pretty, vulnerable acoustic music. And uh, we just <laughs> recorded some music together in Rochester recently um, that'll be coming out that I'm, I'm really proud of. And, uh, and, uh, and then of course, like this Death King stuff, like it's, you know, it's coming soon and uh, it'll be a force. So, uh, you know, I'd say just for anyone watching, you know, keep, keep in touch with all our social media pages and, uh, you know, a lot of exciting stuff in the, in the pipeline right now. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to get back to bringing this new energy and this new balance onto the stage and into performances. I, uh, I feel very excited about it. Nice, nice. Well, this has been really, really wonderful. Thank you for your time. Of course, yeah. Thank you for uh, thank you for having me, and uh, kudos to you for doing such a rad thing with your with your podcast and the zine. And uh, uh, thank thanks thanks again.